with just the, the few of us that own and run this bookstore. This is really uh, a, dis a display of the type of uh, strong community, the strength of the community that we have here. And so I just want to, I always want to point that out. Whenever we bring in someone from out of town, it takes more resources, it takes more uh, money and work. And, uh, and it's really this community and the strength of it and all of you here tonight uh, and everyone who helped us get press and helped forward emails and uh, spread the word, word of mouth, that really makes these kinds of things happen. So thank you for all the work you've been doing. In particular, I want to mention a few people who made some monetary contributions. Um, there, uh, our friend Dylan, who gave an excellent talk recently. Uh, we have two Morgans, including uh, one that's here right now, at least. I can't tell if the other one is. Um, and Karima, and Heinrich Sienkiewicz, of course, and Mike Kuzma. And, uh, and we're going to be passing the hat, so if you, if you didn't hear your name, uh, this is your opportunity. <laughs> Sorry? Um, so, I just wanted to mention that we have a monthly Leonard Peltier event that happens here to give you education on Leonard Peltier's case and related issues. I'm going to pass out some flyers for that. But as you can see on the board, that's not the only thing that's happening this month. It just happens to be the only thing I have flyers for. Uh, also, also, Martin, our friend Martin, is, is excellent support of, uh, of this event and many things that happen at the bookstore. And I just want to say that as a way to point out to people that uh, you know, we're not a money-making enterprise. We can't really afford to do this. This is, this is directly because of uh, support from the community that we've gotten and the work that you all are doing. So I want to thank you again. Uh, in an effort to not go on too long and embarrass Josh too much, uh, Josh and I are old friends, and he's been an inspiration for a long time. And that he's a, he's a very principled person, and he, I've all, even from the beginning of when I knew him, it was he, he was someone who acted out his principles and was willing to sacrifice and uh, and stay the course. And I just. I haven't seen him in a long time, and we've spent some good time together, and it's been really good. And I'm really glad to be able to bring him here to, to this community that we've been working to build and strengthen here in Buffalo to sort of share some experiences that I think that we can all benefit from. It's going to be a question and answer period afterwards. Um, thank you. This is Josh Harper. Have you ever uh, stood in front of an audience before and thought, I really should have written a speech? <laughs> <laughs> um, so a uh, couple things tonight you might have to forgive me for. Uh, one is I am just getting over a respiratory infection, which means sometimes I start coughing really heavily and I'm quick to run out of breath. So uh, bear with me if I have to stop for a moment. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, I'd like to apologize for in advance is that sometimes nowadays public speaking makes me very, very nervous. And the reason for that is because public speaking is what sent me to a high-medium federal prison for three years. Um, I've been out for about three years and five months now, got off of probation about five months ago. But it was what I'm doing right now, as in this moment that caught me terrorism charges. It's what I'm doing right here, right now, that sent me away for the three worst years of my life. So if I get a little short of breath, it might not just be the respiratory infection. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> revolution. Revolution. Never fucking trust anyone who says it that way. <laughs> the thing about revolution, what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, is that it's an incredibly serious subject. The thing about revolution is, is it's not something to just be romanticized. It's not this just beautiful, poetic term. 
Revolution is something that people suffer, suffer and die for. Revolution is something that people are tortured for. Revolution is something that people sacrifice for, that people starve for. Revolution is something that the government uses in it as an excuse to repress people, to grind people into the dirt, to imprison people, to humiliate people, to take from people their dignity. So tonight, as I talk about this, I want you to know I'm not talking about it as somebody who has no clue whatsoever of what it means. Granted, I have only done three short years. The amount of repression that I have faced is nothing compared to the people of places like El Salvador, or Nicaragua, or Cuba, or Guatemala, or on and on and on and on. Um, but I have had a small taste, and several of my friends have tasted it much worse than I have. And through my years of doing prisoner support, I've spoken with people who have had their lives taken from them for very, very innocent things. So this is not something I talk about tonight uh, with no sense of what it means. This isn't something that's grandiose to me or, uh, or simple or just poetic. Uh, I say it because I mean it. And I believe that it's worth risking for and worth fighting for and indeed, eventually, or suffering for them. But I also say it because I believe that there are rewards and I believe that we can win. I'll get back to that in a moment. I, I know that when people are talking to me about very, very heavy things, um, I want to know where they're coming from. I want to know who they are and what qualifies them to be saying these things. So I'm going to go back a little ways and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, my start here on this planet. So um, I was born on January 31st, 1975, uh, down in San Diego, California. It's where I spent the first nine years of my life. So what I grew up around was five-lane, six-lane freeways, smog, city lights that were so bright they blotted out the stars at night. This, is, uh, this was my reality. My idea of nature was strip malls near the beach. Um, I had uh, pretty much no concept of radicalism, but from a young age, I did have one very valuable thing that, uh, that I believe helped me with my revolutionary perspective, uh, and that's that I always hated cops. Uh, <laughs> uh, if there's any of you in the audience tonight, I can hardly say, fuck. My father was a, a, was a Vietnam veteran. And when, um, when he was uh, shipped abroad to uh, shoot at other scared young men and women, um, when he was uh, sent off to kill people in the name of capitalism, um, he was a tank driver. And um, the thing about it was is that uh, that's a pretty traumatic thing to be pushed into when you're 18 years old. So he coped with it the way many GIs coped with it and that was that he used drugs while he was on duty. And so one time uh, he, was in, uh, he was in a tank and uh, he was sitting right next to the munitions and he was smoking a joint and a seed in the joint popped. A piece of the burning joint went and fell into the munitions and blew up. Um, he was uh, covered 70% of his body in third degree burns there was shrapnel that ended up getting lodged in his forehead and his sinuses, some of which it took doctors more than 20 years to figure out how to get rid of. Those little pieces of shrapnel calcified inside of his skull and caused him constant pain. So this is the context that I grew up in. And my father continued to try and treat his pain uh, with various drugs for a very long time um, he was addicted to heroin, as were 25%, one out of four GIs who came back from the Vietnam War. Um, the suffering that my dad had gone through was a constant backdrop uh, to my existence. Um, but um, one of the things uh, that, that resulted from his trying to cope with his pain was that you know, he had a drug habit to feed, and that meant that he was a small-time criminal. Um, he looked the part. You know, he had uh, 
big bushy long hair and he had a tough beard and he kind of dressed like a biker. Um, he was an auto mechanic when he was well enough to work and so he was just this wall of muscle. I think all, all, uh, all people kind of remember their fathers as these very looming giant figures, but my father actually was a looming giant figure. I remember being on the uh, San Diego Beach Pier when I was probably about four or five years old, and we were just going for a walk with my family. Um, I've got a wonderful mother named Rita Riley, who's a vegan and an anarchist. Ooh, nice. She's fucking awesome. And uh, we were with her and my sister Alita, who's just about the most uh, beautiful person on earth. Um, she's autistic, and one very unique, um, unique thing about her disability is that she has no concept of lying, um, which was kind of brutal when I was a teenager. It was like, how does my hair and clothes look? You look terrible. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but, uh, but it's also a wonderful thing about her. You know you're not getting bullshit. <laughs> so we were going for this walk on the, on the Ocean Beach Pier. And uh, there's my dad. And he, you know, looks like a freak to the establishment. And these cops just snatched him up. And uh, they had no problem. And they started shaking him down right there on the pier and embarrassing him, humiliating him, not just in front of the people passing by, but in front of his family. And right away, that kind of clued me into what the police were really about. Subjugation, keeping people down, making sure that folks know there's a hierarchy and what their place is in it. Um, I was, uh, I was pretty devastated by that, but that was far from my last experience with seeing the police mess with my family. And, uh, and then eventually, of course, as I grew older, and I started paying attention to things outside of my little family sphere, you know, more and more and more, I saw the cops aren't there to protect us. So that was important development in my life, number one. <laughs> important development, number two. When I was nine years old, one day I got a surprise visit at, uh, at the school I went to. Uh, my dad was there and apparently all of a sudden we were going on vacation. We were going to drive across the country. Um, what I didn't know is that he was running from drug debts. Hey dad! Um, but fuck it, I got to go to Yellowstone, right? Um, so. We hop into this um, newly purchased uh, pop-top van, and the whole family's there, and I get out of school early, and that's cool. And um, we drive across the country, and we end up eventually in Eugene, Oregon. Now, as I mentioned, I was from this very industrialized area of Southern California, and all of a sudden I get transported out there uh, to the Willamette Valley. I don't know how many of you um, are from the Northeast, and sort of always grew up with the concept of nature being like the Pine Barrens in New Jersey or some bullshit like that, because it's bullshit. <laughs> um, but, uh, but out west, out there in Oregon, Washington, parts of Northern California, a couple little areas in Wyoming and Idaho, uh, we've got big trees, but not just big trees. Um, out in Eastern Oregon, we have deserts, we have rivers, we have oceans, uh, we have grasslands and wetlands. And suddenly being exposed to these things um, was so awe-inspiring to me. Uh, I suddenly became aware of, you know, there was something beyond our human community. There was also this whole biological community. And it was being absolutely devastated. Now, if you're a kid who is not particularly wealthy, and you're from the Northwest, and you're living in small towns, and your dad's got a drug problem, so you're being shipped around to friends, grandparents, and stuff. If you're broke, you don't go to the mall. You know, if you're broke, you're not out shopping or riding a cool new bike. If you're broke, you're going camping. You're getting out into the wilderness a little bit. Because uh, it's something that, you know, believe it or not, you don't need thousands of dollars of REI shit to do. You need a fucking sleeping bag and some willpower. So, um, so yeah. All of a sudden, you know, I'm going out into these, uh, these really gorgeous areas. And as I'm getting older, though, I'm watching these places where I had developed my strongest friendships, places where I had had my first kiss, 
and I'm watching them fall one after another to bulldozers and to chainsaws. And the thing was, is this wasn't just about, you know, forestry where they're going to, you know, warehousers going to come in and plant five trees for every one they murder, you know, it's, no, these places were being cut and they were being developed. They were being paved over. And once that asphalt went down, you knew, you just knew you were never going to see it again. This place that had one time been, you know, trees and streams and wildlife and, and fungus and, and, um, and uh, ferns and <coughs> moss. Now it was going to be a fucking Kmart or it was going to be a Walmart or it was going to be a Target or some other like bullshit plastic filled, you know, exploitation factory filled with, you know, cheap junk from, uh, from you know, the places in the world that we essentially use as our slave labor. And uh, as a kid, you know, that affected me because these places were very much a part of who I was. And so I think for me, that was a sort of important political development number two. Um, all of this leads to important political development in my life, number three. <laughs> um, when I was 15, um, there was, uh, there was uh, this group in Oregon called the Oregon Christians Alliance, uh, the OCA. And uh, what the OCA uh, was existing to do was, um, <clears throat> they were passing local ordinances in towns like Springfield, Oregon, Grants Pass, Zinn, uh, places like this. And uh, the, the local ordinances, what they did was they made it legal to discriminate against somebody on the basis of sexual preference. And so it allowed towns like Springfield to not only fire gay teachers, but also to legally prevent people from running for public office if they were gay, if they were transgender, if they were lesbian. And the thing is, these local ordinances were passing so successfully that the OCA decided they were going to try a statewide initiative. Um, one, one consequence of that was that um, Nazi skinhead groups thought that they had finally found a wedge issue, something that could launch them from being this marginalized uh, group into something with a lot more political power and a lot more um, um, scope as far as recruiting. So they started pouring into this state. Now, me and my friend Joe, we were out one day and and we're walking around the University of Oregon campus looking for skate spots. And we saw an OCA protest. And there's this big, you know, dumb collection of bigots standing there with their signs. And so we're punk kids. What are we going to do, right? We're going we're gonna to shock them. We're going to piss them off. And, you know, so we walk right into the middle of their, their protest. And we embrace. And we have this big, deep kiss. <laughs> and, you know, there's a phone <laughs> You're gonna burn in a lake of fire. Sounds warm. <laughs> and um, so you know, we felt like we had uh, kind of done our duty there as punk kids, and, and we walked off, and and um, and we split up. And that was really the pivotal moment when we split up there because skinheads are cowards, and they always like to outnumber their prey. I started walking down an alleyway on West 13th in Eugene, right behind 7-Eleven, when I got jumped by three or four men, and they kicked the shit out of me, you know? I was bleeding from my ears, I was bleeding from my nose, I was bleeding from my mouth. I couldn't barely move one of my arms. But the thing was, I wasn't really thinking about the beating too much. I was thinking about my dad, because my dad was extremely homophobic. I knew that if I went home, he was going to ask me what had happened and why, and the idea of telling him that it was because I had kissed another man was just about too much for me to handle. So I hid out all day in a park near my house, and I waited till I thought he was asleep. And when I came home, I decided I was going to go in through this kitchen door, and the layout of our house, the kitchen door was right across from this sliding glass door that led on to the back deck. And when I snuck into the kitchen, through the glass door, uh, onto the back deck, I saw my dad beating my dog, Max. 
Now the thing is, is that this was a pivotal moment in my life because just hours before, here I was struggling to escape my own suffering and my own pain and to, to regain some dignity and some freedom. And here I see a member of another species doing the exact same. And suddenly the fact that Max couldn't speak or do math or anything like that, suddenly none of that mattered to me anymore. What I recognized was that he was another being on this planet who just like me wanted liberty and wanted to be free from pain and wanted to be treated with dignity. And that was the moment where this idea of biological community really expanded for me. And I really began to realize that we needed some sort of a, some sort of a struggle, some sort of a fight for all of these other beings. And that led me down the road to doing uh, the vegetarian thing and the vegan thing. But more important, it put the idea of fighting back into my head. You know, I was so angered by what I saw um, that I did intervene, you know. I ran out and I, I got in my father's face, which was a very difficult thing for me to do uh, at 15 years old, but I did do it. Anyhow, I'm going to jump forward uh, many, many years. Um, as I mentioned, I, I started uh, getting familiar with the idea of uh, becoming an animal liberationist. <coughs> I became an activist. I was, I was active with many, many different groups. Uh, but the one I want to talk about, just really briefly, was called Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty. Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty came about as, a, as basically the result of frustration. A lot of us, uh, including a few people who are here in this room tonight, um, were, part of, uh, were part of the movement in the mid-90s. There was this big explosion of youth participation uh, in animal liberation struggles in the United States. And, uh, and we were dedicated, man. We meant it. We meant it so much, but we were um, dumb as fuck. <laughs> and, um, and so all of our concern, all of our, all of our caring, at the end of the day, we had very little idea of strategy or focus. Um, you know, we really thought that if we showed up with uh, signs enough, you know, one week in front of a McDonald's and the next week in front of a laboratory and the next week at a slaughterhouse. And if we chained our necks to enough things and dropped enough banners off a of freeway overpasses, well, that's an option. Um, it's of course not that easy. So Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty came about because we wanted to try new tactics we wanted there to be a single focus, and not just for a group in one region or in one country, but we envisioned a global, worldwide campaign. Um, I very sincerely hate vivisection. I think that it is the height of human arrogance. Um, but there's another important thing to me about the Shack campaign, and was that it was that we were trying to find a way to confront corporate power and wealth. We wanted to find a way that we could go after these multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires, and win. And so, that's exactly what we set out to do. And over the course of the next few years, people got involved in 18 different countries. We went up against some of the biggest financial, well, the biggest financial institutions on earth. HSBC, um, <laughs> you know, U.S. Bank, Bank of America. Um, Citicorp, um, and we also went up against insurance companies, market makers, brokerages, anyone who was propping this company Huntington Life Sciences up. We said, if you have dealings with them, then you are complicit and we are going to stop you. And we did that through a number of means, some of which I remain proud of, some of which, quite honestly, were beyond the pale. The thing is, there's no handbook for being a revolutionary. You don't get classes on it when you're in middle school. And so we had to learn through a process of trial and error. And believe me, oh, we made a lot of errors. But here and there, we also came up with some winning combinations. For example, we started thinking about money and how it exchanges hands and, and what it actually means in terms of corporations. I mean, when you and I exchange money, we're pulling out wallets. 
and we're handing you know money actually directly over to each other or we're basically signing for the money with a credit card or a debit card when corporations are exchanging money especially when it's money in, 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 in amounts of millions tens of millions hundreds of millions billions of dollars it's just data it's just data going from one place to another saying this is owed here this is owed here so we started thinking how does that data move and um, I don't know I don't know how many of you are familiar with the whole black vaccine thing but two years of my three-year sentence come from explaining this tactic that I, I'm about to explain. So this is the act of terrorism I went to prison for. Uh, black faxing is a process where you take three sheets of black paper, they get taped end to end to end, so you've got now one long sheet of black paper. You dial up a phone number, in our case it was usually a bank or a brokerage or a market maker, and when the fax starts to feed through, you take that front end and you tape it to the back end. So now you've got one continuous loop just going through the fax machine. And of course, this means on the other end, all they're getting is black paper. It's wasting their paper, their toner. Move over Al Qaeda. Real <laughs> black. <laughs> I want to point out that the prosecution and the judge in the case and the man who indicted me, Chris Christie, who's now um, thought to be a favorite for the Republican nominee next presidential cycle, um, they all use the term terrorism to describe what I just told you about. Um, this tactic, though, when it was coupled with, uh, with other tactics, such as uh, something called SMTP bombing, uh, which just means sending tons and tons of email data packets uh, to, a, to an email server. Um, something called uh, a war dialing, which is where you would set up an old style modem uh, to just dial a number over and over and over and over again. And that would sometimes be done on thousands of computers across the world. And so a company, not a single line would suddenly work um, there would be denial of service attacks on their website at the same time. So all of a sudden there's this bank tower sitting there and they can't get faxes and they can't get emails and they can't use their phones and their website is down and their customers can't contact them and guess what happens to the money? <laughs> One company uh, Stevens Incorporated, who many of you probably haven't heard of, but they're actually the United States' largest privately held investment banking firm, just from stock devaluation alone, as a result of these tactics, lost $40 million. I mean, this is bigger than arsons. This is bigger than bombings. And we found a way to do it without harming people. We found a way to do it with, um, largely, uh, I mean, the media had a hard time vilifying us because you know Fox News is trying to get all outraged and they're like and they dialed the the other thing about this though was these were tactics that could become popular they were things that almost anybody could participate in they were a tactic that um, that basically could become widespread. Everyone could see themselves doing it, you know? And there was this little bit of mischief to it. Just this little bit of mischief, you know? And for once, you've got these people, these billionaires, people who just shit all over the earth, people who just run roughshod over the rest of us, and all of a sudden, here there is, and there's this kid who's, you know, from Junction City, Oregon, and all of a sudden, they've got to listen. They've got to listen. They've got to pay attention to us. And that was so empowering. After years of slamming our heads against walls and yelling at brick and mortar on the weekend, all of a sudden, our actions meant something. And this was, you know, and this wasn't the extent of it. We had people who were executives who were having their, their boats sunk in harbor. I mean, you know, some yuppies putting on his deck shoes, like heading out to, you know. <laughs> To, uh, to go on a, a sail and all of a sudden ah, there's the boat bobbing in the, <laughs> bobbing in the bay there, you know, a group called Pirates for Animal Liberation actually 
claimed that uh -huh. one. Um, there were other forms of sabotage that were used as well. And, uh, and then there was just, you know, plain old organizing, man, getting people out to events, holding national demonstrations, showing that we had some power. So that's, uh, that's the backdrop. Eventually, uh, some very rich and powerful people. I mentioned um, Stevens Incorporated earlier. Their uh, CEO was this guy, Warren Stevens. He was a multi-billionaire. Um, his wife's best friend is Hillary Clinton. Um, he used to have, he's from Little Rock, Arkansas, so he used to have Bill Clinton over to the house whenever Bill would pass through town. Uh, one time we were protesting in front of his house and uh, it turned out that um, Orrin Hatch was there having dinner at the time. Um, his brother's best friend was Jeb Bush. Um, and we started realizing pretty quick, you know, these folks are connected and eventually there's going to be backlash. Our only hope was essentially to shut HLS down uh, before the backlash came. And unfortunately, uh, that is not what happened. One morning at 6 a.m., I got a phone call and uh, I answer, and uh, my friend on the other line says, hey, uh, the FBI just fucked up. They're trying to carry out a coordinated raid, but they forgot there's this thing called time zones. And so, so they had prematurely arrested somebody in Long Island. And uh, his mother had seen the names on the warrant, started making phone calls. So I'm laying there in bed, and I know my phone is tapped at this point, so I know they know I'm, I'm getting warned, and I got up, and I put on an anti-FBI t-shirt, <laughs> and I started getting dressed, and that's when the banging came on my door, and I'm a smart ass, and so I'm like, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> it was the Department of Homeland Security and a joint terrorism task force, uh, including some members of the JTTF who had been involved in a, a raid on my home just a year previously. Um, and uh, I lived in this building that had a, a courtyard that all of the, the apartments faced out onto. It was the summertime, so everyone had their windows open. And I've got these people out there yelling that I'm being arrested on terrorism charges. Um, Anyhow, I think you all kind of know how it went from there. So, that is my background, and uh, I hope that that uh, makes me sufficiently qualified to talk about what I'm going to talk about next. I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe that we're at a pretty unique point in history right now, and especially U.S. history. Uh, one of the reasons that I think we're at such a, a unique point um, is, uh, is Barack Obama. And, and uh, the reason that I think that he is significant to what I'm about to, uh, to get into here, which is revolution, is um, I remember when I was at, uh, I was at uh, FCI Sheridan, the prison I was being held at. And um, it was the, the night of, uh, <coughs> of the first election that he won. And people are watching the results come back. And when I say people are watching the results come back, I mean the flats, the, the area where there was all these um, gang-controlled um, television screens, were filled. It was vice lords and GDs and Crips and Bloods and Latin Kings and Paisas and I mean, you name it. Everyone was down there on the floor together. Everyone had really bought into this message of hope. Because here was a person who had in the lead been talking about the prison industrial complex. I mean, when Barack Obama first became a state level politician, he was talking about good time allowances. And he was talking about how, how little good time we give prisoners and how that increases the danger of prison and, and on and on and on. How it takes people from their families. I mean, we were all shocked. We'd never really heard a politician talk about that before. Um, he was talking about government accountability. 
He was talking about creating a more transparent system where all of us could see what was going on and therefore react to it because it would not be hidden. We could have some sort of participation in the system that had you know, been a Leviathan, had loomed over us for years and years and just rolled over what the will of the people was. Um, there were so many things that he was talking about that we had really never heard a politician talk about before. You know, he, he was denouncing in, in many ways the violence going on overseas while still kind of half-heartedly supporting what was happening in Afghanistan. But he talked about torture. And he was saying that those who were responsible should be held responsible. You know, he, he was um, talking about the, the military-industrial complex. He was talking about health care in the United States. He was talking about income disparity. When the fuck was the last time you heard a politician talk about that? So as I mentioned, you know, I, I've got a, a mother who's an anarchist and quite a radical. And I even started seeing people in those communities, my mother included, buying into it. And she was like, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to go out and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for this guy. So he did get voted for. And what has happened? We're still killing people overseas. We have a drone program that is murdering children in countries that we do not even have war declared in. Countries that Congress, our supposed representatives, have not even been able to okay. Just recently, his administration uh, were, were being sued for these drone strikes because they were beginning to kill American citizens. You know, I guess children in Yemen and Pakistan and places like that don't matter enough to sue over. But, but American citizens started dying. And do you know what, what, his, what his, uh, his administration's response was? It is legal, but we are not even going to tell you our legal rationale because to explain how it's legal would be a threat to national security. So uh, trust us, it's legal. We're just going to keep doing it. I mean, where's the accountability that was being talked about? Where was this transparency that was being talked about? He had talked about deportation under, uh, under, uh, under George Bush. And guess what? Deportations under his administration have almost doubled. Um, I mean, you know, he was somebody who had said uh, a long time ago that we need to start worrying about um, surveillance technologies. But now his administration has prosecuted more people for trying to reveal what our government, the crimes our government is committing than all previous administrations combined. I mean, we have people here in the United States for, who, for exposing war crimes, have been imprisoned now for over 1,000 days without charge. I mean, this is absolute insanity. And this was the result of our hope. This was, our, our, this was the result of our thinking that we could accomplish something from within the system that for once we could somehow turn the tide on the people who we know really own shit, you know, the rich, the ruling class. This was our attempt at handling things without resorting to force, without having to get into the streets, without having to create a revolution. And it failed. It failed miserably. Barack Obama is the most right-wing president in history. And I'm going to say that unashamedly. I'm going to say that as, as directly as I can. This isn't political hyperbole. This isn't me trying to be cute or say something controversial. He is worse than George Bush. And one of the things that makes him worse is that he's got that great smile and that wonderful charisma. And people still believe his bullshit. But when you look at things from a statistical standpoint, when you look at things from a reality standpoint, I mean, here was a guy who was saying he was going to go in, he was going to defend women's rights. It has become more and more difficult under his administration for a woman to get an abortion than almost any other time since it was made illegal. It boggles the mind that people can still look at him and say, oh, he's a socialist, he's a radical leftist. Are, is anyone else fucking paying attention? I mean, Chris Rock. When you're sending in, when you're sending in drones to murder people overseas, and you're saying that anyone over a certain age in a certain region is a target, and that's how you're keeping down the civilian casualty numbers. 
there is a problem. So I want you all to think about something for a moment. I want you to think about, we are currently on land governed by people who, all the other problems I've mentioned tonight, everything else about ecological catastrophe and, and the, the murder of billions of animals every year, and I mean, on and on. This land is governed by people who willingly murder children. And for what? I mean, we're, taught, we're told about national security. Has anyone paid any attention to what's going on with oil contracts in the Middle East right now? Who's getting them? It's not the people of Iraq. It's not the people of Afghanistan. These are going to Shell. And they're going, they're going to American corporations. I mean, this is what this is about. Our government, including our president, is willing to murder children for oil. What fucking point do we look at that and say, that is beyond the pale. We cannot stand for this. This is something that demands, that cries out uh, for some sort of justice, for someone to stop it. Now, we've tried to stop it in the courts, but what have they said? Oh, we don't even have to tell you uh, what the legal rationale is. We've tried to stop, stop it through voting and on and on and on. And we've seen in every instance that they're not going to willingly give up their power. They're not going to say, well, enough people wrote on this slip of paper that they wanted to stop, so fuck the billions of dollars, let's give people their way. No. This is the ruling class. They are callous and they are used to stomping on us. It's how they got where they were. Historically, it's always been how they've maintained their power. It's always been about military might. It's been about controlling people through the media and controlling people through religious institutions. But now, I want to get into why uh, the title of this particular speech is Revolution Before It's Too Late. We have something new to contend with, something that previous generations of revolutionaries did not. And that is surveillance technologies and the increasing power of these surveillance technologies and the increasing ubiquity of these surveillance technologies. Raise your hand if you have a cell phone in your pocket right now. No. Surveillance technologies. Surveillance technologies. Raise your hand if you have a webcam on your computer. Ra fuck that. Raise your hand if you use a computer. <laughs> See, that's just the beginning of it. There's this thing uh, in the world of technology uh, that's called function creep. Um, cell phones several years ago, um, industry groups started lobbying to be able to, uh, to turn them on remotely, to listen remotely, to use the cameras on them remotely. And the reason they said that they needed those capabilities was for lost children, lost and missing children. Right. We had to be able to find kids who had run away or who were kidnapped. And so even when the, the cell phone was turned off, they needed the capability to be able to listen. And then, of course, technology keeps progressing. It progresses at a more and more rapid rate. And so cell phones, sorry? You know, I just read Crime Thinks Work. It's a book by Crime Think called Work. I thought the best part of it was that there's perceived obsolescence and there's planned obsolescence. Like, for instance, you know, maybe someone who made $100,000 in 1980 was rocking the um, tape deck, and then you go from tape deck to CD, CD to internet radio. So it's just to keep selling, selling, sell, 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 sell. sell. Where a tape deck's pretty damn good. A vinyl's pretty damn good. CD is pretty damn good, but it's never good enough. We never, we can't ever just be satisfied. We have to keep buy, 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 buy. Right. The thing is, is that we're not just, uh, we're not just here today to worry about how we're being economically exploited by corporations. I think everyone here knows they're being economically exploited by, by corporations. But these cell phones, as they've increased in power, and I'm not here tonight really to talk about just cell phones, but this is sort of one basic component, as they've gotten GPS tracking on them, as they've gotten video capability, um, and on and on and on, what we're seeing is they're becoming more functional as devices to watch the populace as lo at large. Um, another thing that's happening, we see um, 
you know, we see security cameras everywhere, everywhere nowadays. And security cameras, when they first went in, you know, we were told, well, it's going to prevent crime or it's going to make you more secure when you're at the, uh, the ATM. But again, there's this function creep. And now, the thing about security cameras, one thing that's made it into the, the news a lot is you hear about facial recognition technology. Facial recognition technology is just, I mean, the tip of the proverbial iceberg mm -hmm. as far as the threat of surveillance cameras. The thing about surveillance cameras is, is there is technology already available that can recognize our irises. Technology that's already available that can recognize our unique walk the unique patterns that we, we move in. The more distance. Take yes. questions at the end of the one. You know, and, and now there are, there are uh, of course, in London, only a few years ago, they deployed surveillance uh, cameras that also have very strong audio capabilities, including hearing people's voices, recognizing people's voices, but also being to identify people if their voices changed or if they're sick, like I am tonight, you're not getting those awesome, husky, rich tones in my voice. Um, but they recognize um, vocabulary selection. They recognize the pace and speed that people talk at. I mean, we're also seeing um, processing power become faster and faster and faster. Data storage becoming uh, increasing, uh, and the amount of storage that can be had is increasing rapidly. And what this means is that fewer and fewer people can monitor more and more and more of the population at large. What does this mean for us? I mean, we already know the direction that military technologies are going. We already know how powerful those are becoming. I would argue that what this means for us is that if we want to see any kind of type of real change, and I don't just mean like, you know, uh, the cost of health care goes down a little bit, or uh, a couple more of us get some insurance. No, I, I mean something very, very radical, uh, very revolutionary, something that is more just to a greater portion of the population. If we want to see this, does this mean that we now have a shrinking window of time that it's still possible? Because if the people in charge can watch everybody at once, if they know at all times how we're behaving, and therefore, to some degree, how we're thinking, um, what, I mean, we already know what they're willing to do to people who fight back, right? Has anyone been paying attention since, you know, well, the founding of this country? <laughs> Shit. We know what they'll do. We know what they'll do. And once they have the power to do it to all of us, once they have the power to watch everybody at once, what does that mean for the prospects of revolution in the United States? Now, I said earlier tonight that revolution is serious business and that it's dangerous business. I talked a lot about consequences, and I want you to know that I barely scraped the surface of consequences that people have faced. I mean, this is a government who, um, you know, they murdered Fred Hampton in his home. This is a government that bombed uh, a city block in Philadelphia um, to, uh, to eradicate the MOVE organization. Uh, this is a government who armed gang members in Los Angeles, California to murder members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, this is a government who in 1998 was found liable for the assassination of Martin Luther King. And I can keep going. Um, these are all very serious things. But while we think about the risks, I also want people to think about rewards. I want, to think, I want people to think about what it means to face down a person who has pushed them down, crushed them down their entire lives. What does it mean for your human dignity to finally face up to them and say, fuck no, hell no, I am not going to stand for this any longer. I am not going to be humiliated in this way. I'm not going to be told that I don't deserve health care because I'm poor. I'm not going to be told that I don't deserve shoes because I'm poor. I'm not going to be told that my children don't deserve the same education because they're not rich. What does that mean to us? What does that mean to our hearts to finally face them down and to say, absolutely not, absolutely not. As somebody who has faced down police forces and FBI and counterterrorism teams and billionaires 
people who their whole lives looked down upon me and my family and my community and, and the people who I lived with to face them down. Oh my God, it did my heart good. What would it mean if we began to fight back and we began to win? What would this mean to, to the ecological situation on this planet? What would it mean to our personal health situation on this planet? What would it mean for the billions of animal lives who are currently being exploited by big agriculture, pharmaceutical companies, and so on? I think those rewards are pretty amazing. So, it's a difficult thing though, right? I mean, they've got all of this technology, and they've got all this money, and they have the military, and they have the police, and what do we have? It's going to be pretty disappointing when I say it, we have heart, at least some of us do, at least some of us still have it. When I was in prison, I was in there with whew, some, some rough dudes, man, and, and I'm a fucking nerd. I'm like, I'm like who wants to play D&D? <laughs> uh, everyone's named like Ice Pick and Shank Dog. And, uh, I'm in here for animal rights. <laughs> <laughs> And the thing is, all these guys in there had, you know, these real tough knuckle tattoos. It was game over, stay down, don't hire. Um, <laughs> and when I got out, uh, I know I've got these silly billboards on my hand, but there's a reason that I wanted to get care a lot on my hand. <laughs> and the reason is this. If I didn't care, if I didn't care, I never could have made it through the things that I made it through. Having guns shoved into my face, being watched and monitored and followed, I found out at one point that my best friend was being paid $70,000 a year to spy on me. One of my housemates had been in negotiations with the FBI to get a car to spy on me and my girlfriend. Um, I'd been beaten. I would say that to a much lesser degree than many people who our government has gone up against, but I have been tortured. Um, you know, and then ultimately I went into prison where I faced a lot of violence, including sexual violence at the hands of guards. If I did not care, I would have ended it. I would have gotten out, I would have settled down, I'd stop making speeches like this, which I already know can send me back to prison. Um, I would have given up, but I didn't. And I didn't because I care. So I've seen to some small degree what caring, what giving a fuck, what, what caring about, you know, the children I mentioned abroad, what caring, you know, about these animals who are being tortured in labs. I've seen what it can push you through. And the thing is, is that history provides us with a lot of other examples of folks who have faced down the worst things and come out on top. So tonight, I can't offer you any uh, grandiose revolutionary plan, anything scientific that says if you do A and B, the result will be C. Um, honestly, I don't have that. I don't know how to best tell you to overthrow this government, but what I can say is that if you care, if you've got something deep, deep, deep in here, and you want it bad enough, it'll propel you to do things that will amaze even you. And it'll give you the courage to face down those guns and those bombs and maybe someday those drones. Because if they're using them abroad right now, believe me, the situation gets bad enough in the United States, they will use them domestically. If you care, we can still win. Fire to the prisons. Thank you for having me tonight.